Hello everyone and welcome to the next talk in the Eric Northeast and Tees Valley Wildlife Recorders Conference. Thanks so much for joining us for these talks and um, especially for this one. Thank you. I think we are in a privileged position because I think we're the first group to hear publicly from the Sea Watch Foundation on the results of the National Whale and Dolphin Watch 2020, which is the subject of this talk today. Uh, we've got a great group of uh, enthusiastic cetacean supporters here in the northeast of England. So hopefully uh, a lot of you are, are tuning in to listen to this talk. It's been a strange year, so it'll be interesting to hear perhaps some thought provoking results. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing a bit more about them. Our speaker is Dr. Chiara Giulia Bertulli from the Sea Watch Foundation. So thank you, Chiara. We really appreciate uh, the effort you've put into getting this talk uh, recorded and sent through to us. It's pre-recorded and um, whilst it's broadcast, uh, Chiara will actually be present to answer questions in the chat section or the comments. Mostly people are uh, putting the questions through in the chat section, so probably best to do that. Um, we've got a sort of double whammy here because we've also got uh, Martin Kitching, who's a local cetacean expert and enthusiast. Martin did our training for the National Whale and Dolphin Watch um, on our Facebook page this year, so um, that's still available to look at if you have a, have a find the Eric Facebook page. So Martin's also present during this talk, during the premiere. So we've got two experts to answer questions, Chiara and Martin. I'll just do a little introduction to Chiara so we can get to know her better. She's the Sightings, the Sea Watch Foundation Sightings Officer, and has been in that role since March 2018. Her uh, PhD in marine biology was gained at the University of Iceland. She was born in Italy though, and spent her early career working as a naturalist in Norway, Iceland and Wales, where she guided tours in English, French and Italian. She spent more than 10 years focusing on evaluating conservation, demography, social structure and health status of coastal cetacean species and she's worked in both the Northern and the Southern hemispheres. But it was in Iceland that she spent eight years on a long-term citizen science project. And that focused on studying population biology and conservation of common minke whales, white beaked dolphins, harbor porpoises and humpback whales. So that involved collecting data from onboard whale watching boats, working side by side with academic, commercial and environmental organisations, as well as the general public. So got an absolute wealth of knowledge and experience and an overflowing enthusiasm for the subject. So we're really um, grateful to have you taking the time, Chiara, to, to speak to us today. I'm going to hand over to you and uh, look forward to hearing from you and we'll see everyone in the, the chat section. So thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Chiara and I work as sightings officer for the Sea Watch Foundation. I'm here today to talk about National Wild and Dolphin Watch and to share a preview of our um, National Wild and Dolphin Watch results. And before I even begin, I really would like to thank Fiona for inviting me here today. What a great opportunity. Thank you so much. And I would like also to thank you, all of you out there. Thank you for taking the time to tune in and thank you for your interest. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off my camera. I have prepared a presentation for you. Let's concentrate on that. And then I'll turn on my camera again towards the end of my talk to say my goodbyes. So let's get started. Here we go. So um, Sea Watch, um, this is us on a slide very much. There is a number of other people, but this is really the core of the stuff that operates behind the scene. This is my boss, he does a lot of things. I don't even know if I have enough time to describe everything that he does. It's an incredibly important player uh, and is a creator of Sea Watch really. Uh, sea Watch that was created 
back in the 70s and got the name of the Sea-Watch Foundation in the early 90s. So we've operated for a very long time. Then there is me, very smiley, happy face on the slide. I work as sightings officer, and which means that I'm in charge of our uh, network of volunteers, network that collects uh, sightings and effort data around the UK. So that is the core of our citizen science project which I'll tell you more, uh, a little bit more about in few slides time. Then there is my colleague, Catherine. Um, she still uh, works within our citizen science project, but she's primarily concentrating on uh, Wales. Um, her headquarters, and many of you know, are in New Quay, in the lovely uh, town side of New Quay. And so, um, as some of you know as well, there is a semi-resident population of almost dolphins there, hypoporpuses are sighted, just to mention some of the core species that you can see in the area. And she's uh, coordinating um, teams of um, volunteers then join us every summer. And she works with them in collecting and analyzing data, uh, data collected from the land and from the sea. And the last but not least, there is Kirsten. And she's our adopted dolphin manager. Um, our adopting uh, dolphin scheme is pretty much like an incredibly byproduct of the many decades of, 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 of data collection and research that we've conducted um, off Cardigan Bay. And she's also um, in charge of our education program. So what do we do? And so I think that just to sum it all up, really, the most important thing that we do and that uh, really it's incredibly important to us is to uh, gather information about cetaceans. Cetacean is simply like um, a word that collectively include uh, whales, dolphins and porpoises. And um, how do we monitor? Uh, how do we monitor in them? We have decided to embrace fully the concept of citizen science, which means that we like to involve the general public in the monitoring of cetaceans. So we work with people that have no scientific background. Um, we work pretty much with anyone that has shared the same interest um, with us, um, people that um, care about our oceans and care about our marine mammals, really. Um, so we involve the public and we also interested in um, sharing then what we find and all the information that we gather. And that's the reason why we're very much involved as well in education. We like to inform uh, people and we like to raise awareness and to advise as well. So a sightings officer, um, there's two things that I am very much involved into. Um, there's certainly um, the whole concept of citizen science. So I work with the public. I also work with people that have a scientific background, so I don't want to exclude those people from this presentation, but it's very important as well to mention that um, to be involved in our project, um, you know, people out there don't need to have a scientific background. They just need to have the time, the interest, the passion for it. And so I do a lot of working with many different people with different backgrounds. And what we do together is we collect scientific data that then are analyzed by me and by collaborators of ours. And then they are then um, um, inserted into peer review publications. They are presented as reports and they are shared with appropriate bodies. What I'm also involved with, maybe a little bit less so this year, for reasons that you might be familiar with, I'm also involved in outreach. There is no science, it's certainly not citizen science without um, the, uh, the, you know, the engagement that is necessary um, and with the involvement um, with people out there. So um, this year it was a little bit less um, of outreach or direct outreach because of the COVID restrictions that we um, that, that were set in place. But um, uh, there's something that it's very important to us and that we generally spend a lot of time uh, focusing on as well. And it, it certainly are, you know, we were all very tested this year um, because of the pandemic, but um, we really found an easy way out of it. And thanks to the existing technology, um, we went digital, so we still reached out to a number of people. We just um, in, went online and instead of interacting personally 
uh, with people who had just um, started using apps and, you know, sort of uh, talking to people behind the screen, but that worked really well as well. Um, so before, before I even begin talking about National Wall and Dolphin Watch, tell you a little bit more about the event and then introduce you to this year's findings, I really would like to take the time to thank you, uh, a group of very special people. Um, I don't even know how to begin, but um, so this year's success has definitely been possible. Thank you to um, Thank you to uh, two very speci special people that I have, um, have on the slide, um, uh, Sean and Jay. Uh, they um, have applied to become National Wild and Dolphin Watch assistants um, before even the summer began. Um, they were selected in May and we've worked together uh, since. They've been with me for a very, very long time. Um, it's, it's incredible how long it has been. And they have been literally the driving force behind all this event. They've been incredibly supportive, incredibly present, incredibly enthusiastic and motivated. They've been involved in recruiting volunteers. They've been involved in confirming watches. They have been, you know, sending emails out, retrieving data, entering data in our database, and the list goes on and on and on. I could have never done it without um, either of them. And I really would like to take the time to thank them, both of them, from the bottom of my heart. Um, a big, big, big thank I would like also to give to Matt, Massey, and Jody. They've been involved as well at some point in the recruiting of volunteers um, or participants, National Wind Dolphin Watch participants, because um, you know it's it's a it's it's a nationwide event. So um, more help was needed at some point, and so they were very, very. Um, gracious to help us uh, with that as well. Um, but they've been incredibly important in particular um, on social media. Um, they were the people behind the scenes, making posts, answering messages, promoting the event, and and you know sharing every single thing that was recorded uh, during the event before an event, even an after the event. Um, it's, it's, it's been an incredible journey with them as well. Um, we've, they've done an incredible work this year. Uh, our social media channels have really shine and that's thank to, to them. So thank you so much, guys. Um, I'd also would like to thank Jasmine. Uh, she has joined us this year. Um, she uh, was uh, basically the narrator the the um the person that um narrated the story to everyone every day um she wrote blogs on our website by the way that's what i'm trying to say um she um was the person taking the time every day to summarize everything that happened on a daily basis she'd spend lots of time in the field every day conducting watches literally every every day she would then come home and exchange information with me. We would just work the blog out together, et cetera, et cetera. It's been, it's been great. Uh, the blog has been such a great success. And uh, thank you, Jasmine, for making it so special. And thank you for taking that on board. Uh, we're very pleased with how well the blog, the National Wind of Watch blog was received. So we'll definitely try to uh, continue, uh, continue in it uh, next year. Uh, last but not least, uh, Philip, thank you so much. I don't know if you're tuning in today, but um, Philip has helped um, making this presentation possible. He has helped me analyzing data and um, it has been incredibly helpful, really. Um, it's, uh, it's been really great to um, be helped in sort of merging all the data together and in having all the figures and maps that I needed um, for this presentation and for our final National Wild and Dolphin Watch report. So thank you, Philip. All right, let's begin. So National Wild and Dolphin Watch, um, it takes place in the summer. It takes place in the summer and um, generally it's between July and August. Um, every year we create a new flyer like the one you see here. And um, we try to sort of 
um, convey the right messages in it. We provide dates. This year, the event ran from the 25th to the 2nd of August. We try to show people that anyone can really participate, grown-up kids, anyone. Uh, we show them that people can reach the coastline, they can go boating, they can do both, or they can just simply like let us know if they see anything while they're walking outside. This year, we also had our regional coordinator, Lauren, who made an incredibly nice uh, promo video for the event, which I'm showing a short clip here. It was super nice, very visual, very catchy. We posted it on our website, we shared it on our social media, and it's incredibly great to, to sort of capture really the essence of the event. Um, National Dolphin Watch in itself is an opportunity that we have to raise awareness of the diversity of cetaceans in the UK. It's an opportunity for us to engage with the public even more. It takes us in the core of the summer when, this, when, when the weather is at its best, or most of the time is. So it's a good opportunity for us staff and for people out there to, you know, go around and about and to start looking at the sea and see what we sight. It's an opportunity for us to um, uh, have many more eyes like scanning the sea and recording the presence or absence of whales, dolphins, and porpoises. So with that incredibly large sample of data that every year we collect in such a short period of time, we can really learn so much about animals distribution, movements, habitat use, human pressure and population trends. So our knowledge about cetaceans with all that is collected there, it's incredible. So we have people all around the UK um, that get involved in either F-related watches, which are either conducted on, on, on at sea or conducted on land, or we have people that don't have the time to conduct an F-related watch, which literally is a person finding a land or boat location and standing there for half hour longer collecting not only um, presence or absence of cetaceans but also collecting environmental parameter and taking um, gps position of marking the effort that is being spent uh, if people don't have that time um, they also they could also get involved into the event by simply submitting casual sighting so they only submit presence data but they still submit something on extremely that is extremely valuable so when people conduct the watch what do they need to bring with them i say it's very few things which are incredibly uh, incredibly important first of all it's a camera these days people can also bring a smart a smartphone since um most of the smartphones are incredibly good photos and take videos but let's be more traditional uh, a camera it's something very important you can capture what you're viewing you can film it and then you can just re-watch it again you can share it with us and then so much uh, information come out of it with a video you can retrieve and recount the number of animals and watch all over and over again um, you know providing a, a more and more refined estimate you can share that video or photos collected with people like yourself if knowledge about cetaceans is uh, limited and then by picking up um, identifying features um, captured in video or in in film then um, you can work out the identification of the species. It's an incredibly important tool. Binoculars, some of us are very good high sight. Binoculars do even better. <laughs> um, when animals are um, not that close, or even when they are, binoculars allow us to see uh, so many details, to really be there without really disturbing the animals and just capturing all the details that we need, really. We can really do a good, proper, bias-free counting on animals. We can literally understand really well everything that animals do. So binoculars are incredibly essential. Very important to bring, obviously, um, a recording form, especially for people that conduct F-related watches. There's a space to collect environmental data and there's a space to report sightings or to leave empty if sightings are not recorded. Absence data are as valuable as presence data. And last but not least, um, something that we always like to encourage people to bring are, um, is a copy of our citation um, ID guide. It can be downloaded for free from our website. If people want to go 
more eco-friendly. They can save it on their phone and just sort of access it when they are land watching. Otherwise, if people want to bring them with them, they can just print it, maybe laminate it since or put it in the and an envelope since uh, or um, in a folder since the weather and sometimes in AK is a bit changeable and then they can kind of access this whenever they they like it's um kind of a, a good thing to have um photos of every single species that can be cited in UK waters because it could become handy um when conducting a watch and even when conducting uh, a casual uh watch meaning even when people like are out and about, walking their dogs, walking along the coast, jogging. You know, it's always good to have because if you cite something, you just want to immediately find out what it is that you've just seen. Um, people that conduct affiliated watches or that record casual sightings um, are generally asked not only to report what they cite, so they tell us which cetacean species they cite. And by the way, this year we've also received records on non cetacean species we receive pinnipeds and 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 species like turtles and fish and sharks and so forth we'll talk about that in, in a few slides time so there's so much more than just cetaceans that people report which we're all very interested in as well but overall regardless of the species that people report um besides telling us which species they're citing we asked them to tell us um uh, how many animals were there. So we asked to report their numbers to us or the group size as we call it. They'll tell us what they do. So they'll collect their behaviors. They'll keep an eye on the weather and how it changes throughout the watch or they'll provide a snapshot of the weather when they submit the casual sighting. They'll tell us exactly where the animal have been Either they have their GPS with them, either they're on a boat and they can retrieve it from the bridge. Uh, sometimes people are comfortable using a smartphone and they can get coordinates that way. Other times people retrieve them once they're back home. But coordinates are essential to track where the effort era, what the effort has been spent, um, geographically speaking, and also to pinpoint where the animals were, in which exact location they were sighted. Last but not least, we'll ask them to take photos. So this is uh, a very nice first map that I wanted to show with you where um, you can see where all the effort has been spent. So people have been boating and land watching. And in blue, we have um, boats. Uh, we have boats being involved this year. And in green, we have the land watch location being covered. Sometimes they kind of overlap with one another. So, uh, you know, just take that into account as well. Incredible results this year. We had an overall of 185 land watch, land watch sites, which were covered, and 49 vessels involved. And as you can see from the map, people have been uh, watching from literally everywhere, from Shetland all the way down to the Channel Island, and then all the way west, covering the Isle of Man, all the inner outer Hebrides, and, and including also Northern Ireland. So everyone has literally been involved. If we talk about the data that we have collected, let's start focusing on the effort first. So talking about our effort, um, this graph in particular is here to summarize the hours of effort that have been spent per region. So our sightings network um, sees the UK being divided in 35 regional area, and that's what is displayed here. And they've been uh, named, um, as you can see on the x-axis of this graph. By looking at the effort, this year there has been an incredibly high effort being spent uh, here and expressed in hours of observation, 1,739. This has been the highest effort that we have recorded in the last three years, at least. I took over the Royal Settings Office in 2018. I've organized National Group and Watch since. So uh, since I took over my role, this is definitely the highest um, effort I've ever recorded during the event. And I'm very, 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 very grateful for that. And it's incredibly, rewarding result. Um, and by looking at these um, 
overall number uh, of hours being spent. Let's have a look a little bit more in depth into the regional areas. So if we look in particular um, into um, the northeast of England, I know that there's a number of you that are following this presentation today that they are from that area, then um, uh, the overall amount of hours being spent in North East England is 123. Um, um, many hours being spent um, looking out for um, citations. So thank you so much for that. This equals uh, around 7%. Uh, it's, it's equal around 7% of the overall um, effort hours. Then if we move on, um, from the effort into the sightings. Um, what we can say is that as it happened in the past, the vast majority of sightings were collected from land locations. And in particular, 72% uh, of all sightings were recorded from the land during the 2020 event. Um, as you can see from the graph on the left, the land watch platforms are color coded in orange. The blue indicate the boat platforms indicating motorized boats, in yellow the non-motorized, and in, in red are platforms that were uh, of a known origin. So you can definitely tell by looking at the, at, at, at the uh, quantity of, of orange showing in every single um, column that uh, histogram that um, yeah, land locations have definitely uh, been conducted for the vast uh, majority. And um, then if we consider, again, uh, if we look back at the proportion of sighting that were F-related and casual, um, then this year has been really a tie in the sense that in the past, at least in the past few years since I took over the role, um, F-related uh, sighting because this is what is explained in the pie chart here, um, I've always been more than the casual. This year, something has changed. We have had very close results for casual and F related. So we have a 50 for casual and a 49 for effort. So it's almost a 50 50. Um, we're very, very grateful for the many people that spent hours looking out for animals, so conducted F related. I'm incredibly grateful for. There's so many people out there that have submitted so many casual. Um, there has been so much involvement through social media. Um, we're very grateful for the many people out there that have shared the news, that they have reported citing to us. Um, thank you for all the original coordinators that have used their platforms to record signing and then share them with us. Again, it's been incredible. So this results definitely um, show that. If we then look at uh, sightings overall, this is where they're all being mapped, all of them, regardless of the fact that they are collected from the land or from the sea. And um, the total amount of sighting collected this year is 1,276. So this number um, has is lower than the number that has been reported in the last few years. Last year we went over 2,000. The year before that. In 2018, we had bitten the number reported in 2017, and it was more than this year, but not that much more. But it was higher, obviously, than the year prior. And it, we were all incredibly uh, pleased that numbers were keep on growing. This year has been a bit different. Let's put it this way. It really has been. You know, COVID has again, tested our patients, tested us in general, has restricted our movements and, and what we were allowed to do and, you know, and, and so much more. So I don't think it's even uh, the matter of like, you know, looking at the number and thinking, okay, it's less than last year. I don't think that that's important. I think every year is important as it is. And if we consider that the event run for nine, nine days, and we collected uh, over a thousand sighting. That's incredible. So that's where I'm going to, you know, this is this is that whole message that I would like to convey to everyone. Incredible, incredible. So for the first time as well, looking into sightings, if we break down these 1,276 sightings into uh, areas, 
we have England that has taken the lead for the first time, for the first time, at least in the last three years. Uh, the lead has always been uh, taken by Scotland. Um, so England is taking the lead with over five, with 573 sightings followed very closely by Scotland with 508 and then followed by Wales with 194. And last but not least, Northern Ireland with a sighting. Um, so that's the breakdown of our total amount of sighting. If we look at the species that were recorded during the event, and they, you know, that they they resulted in the 1,276 sightings, then we have uh, nine different cetacean species, including the Atlantic white-sided, the bottom dolphins, the harbor porpoise, the humpback, the minke whale, the orca, the rhesus, the common dolphin, and the white big dolphin. And then there was a small sample of uh, species that were cetacean, but they were not uh, that were not identified. On top of this um, nine cetacean species, we also had records of gray and common seals. Thank you everyone for reporting them to us. It was really nice to see these uh, records coming through. And last but not least, we also had a small sample of basking shark sightings and sunfish. And that's what makes, um, you know, and th this what summarize the number of different species that we're collecting during the event. If we are looking at going a bit further and combining information together, if we're looking at our regional areas again, and we are to graph the number of sightings per region and paired up as well with the number of species, that's what we're looking at in this graph. So what's, what's important to take and, to, and to, 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 to get from this graph is the following. So if we're looking at England, we know England has reported the highest amount of sighting. The region that have the highest number of sighting are South Devon, Cornwall, and Northeast England. If we're looking at Scotland, we have the top three from the highest to the lowest, like we have just done for England, are North, North, Northwest Scotland, the Inner Hebrides, and Shetland. In Wales, and this might as well reflect the fact that our effort on the West Coast was very good because we have definitely collected some really valid uh, uh, pieces of information there, but um, our team was not really present on site. Um, our office has been closed since last year and um, we had no interns um, working with us on site there. Um, our monitoring officer had, was furloughed as well during that time. So our effort there was incredible, but way less than it usually is. This year for the first time, North Wales has recorded more sighting than the West Coast. Um, so this is what it is to, you know, what you can read um, from this graph. And if we're looking at the Northeast England, and then again, we want to sneak peek in there because of, you know, of our collaboration with Fiona and, and everything. And um, what we know of Northeast England is that they uh, have recorded 113 sightings, so 10% of the sighting that were correct, collect, collected overall, and they've positioned themselves in third place um, for among those regions that have collected the highest amount of sighting in England. If we're looking at the species that were collected in Northeast England, we definitely um, should mention um, that um, the bottlenose, the harbor porpoise, the minke whale, and the white big dolphins were recorded among the cetacean species, and then there were some harbor and gray seal being collected, um, if we can see the pinnipeds. And um, all species that possibly, we, we can, what we can say, they are possibly the most um, common in the area, and uh, very nice to see all of them uh, being present this summer as well. If we're looking at the locations uh, from which all these sightings were collected on the northeast of England, um, I created this map showing in red a number of these locations where um, watches were collected, land and boat watches. Um, and there are a total of 20 different locations and I marked some of them here. You see the red dot indicating some of them. And then in blue, they're all the sightings being recorded in the area. 
And then let's take a look at this graph here. And this graph on the other hand uh, shows, um, so it goes to combine, it provides information combining siting and effort together. So we're still looking at regional areas and we're looking at how um, the relation between siting and effort has kind of, um, uh, how the how the, the the relation between siting and effort was this year. So we're talking at siting rate, siting rate. Um, so we're basically relating the site into the effort that has been spent on a regional uh, basis. So when we look at this figure in particular, we can tell that there are some region where the sighting rate has been incredibly high. So higher than one and even higher than two. We have East Kent, Northwest Scotland, the North Grampian region, North Devon, North Wales, Outer Ebridge, the Isle of Man, uh, North East Scotland, South Devon. They were all kind of above the average. And most of them were even around one or more, which means that in those regions, there was at least one cetacean species being cited per hour. Um, the overall, um, uh, the overall uh, national average, though, average citing rate, however, has marginally decreased this year compared to last year and the year prior, and with an average of 0 0.6. Um, the relation between citing and effort and the citing rate being calculated being lower um, always is um, a result of a number of different uh, parameters or factors, one being the effort that is being spent originally and um, overall, um, as it was, uh, it's been generally impacted by the weather and is also being impacted by the number of people they are conducting uh, watches uh, regionally. So the number of watching bees organized. And last but not least, by the overall general conditions that they are, they exist and they are in place in the sea where animals and cetaceans occur. So what National Wild Dolphin Watch has certainly taught us is that uh, when we're considering whales, dolphins and porpoises in UK water, there's a lot to say. There's uh, a lot that can be cited, and not only just in the summer when the show of watch take place, it, it can be observed all year long. We have an incredibly high amount of cetacean species in UK water, which is up to 30. So um, I hope that this is going to give you a reason to spend uh, COVID-19 restrictions permitted and social distancing a bit more time if you haven't spent it uh, already. Um, walking along the shore and looking out for cetaceans. It, it's an incredibly unique experience. Overall, we have 30 cetacean spaces in the UK and 13 of them can be cited, generally or expected to be cited in the summer months. If we are considering um, species, um, cetacean species that have been cited in the northeast of England and that we have on records, and here I had a look at our online citing database and reported uh, and, and looked at the species that we had on record, then we have the following one that you could see all year long. We have the minke whale, uh, my absolute favorite <laughs> whale, uh, is recognized by the pointed snout and uh, white pectoral fins. And then we have the harbor porpoise, the smallest cetacean that we have in UK waters. It's only a meter and a half, and it has that very blunt uh, snout and absence of a beak and a very small triangular shaped dorsal fin right in the middle of the back. And we have the bottlenose dolphins, probably the most known dolphins of all and widely distributed. And then we have the orcas. Um, orcas that um, can also be sighted um, uh, around northeast England. We have um, records of them around the Farnia Island. They're very, very easy to distinguish. They have um, dark, uh, dark coloration, a black coloration, uh, white patches as well, and a white and a gray saddle patch makes them very unique. White big dolphins. I know it's not good to talk about favorites, but my second favorite, so I'll say anyway. 
um, incredibly um, different uh, dolphin to observe, very acrobatic, incredibly um, um, active, and definitely a species that people um, uh, should should see and should um, enjoy. Um, they're very, very known around Northeast England, and they have a very tall falcate dorsal fin. Their coloration is a play on gray, off-white, dark gray, and they have this like stripes on their flanks and they're incredibly um, playful and acrobatic. Then there is, there are the Atlantic white-sided dolphins and we have a small, small sample of sighting. So they're not too common, but they're still sighted around County Durham and Northumberland. Um, they're sturdy and similar in some ways to the wide beak dolphins. In fact, they share something. Uh, they have something in common, but their coloration changes entirely. Um, the stripes that we see in, in the white beak, we don't really encounter here. And on top of everything, what makes them really distinct is that sort of um, ochre patch they have on the peduncle that makes them very unique. And we have the humpback quail, um, it's probably the second most known and popular cetacean species. Um, they're known for the to they're known because they're breaching out of the water. They're known for their long pectoral flippers, not really had, but they're also very well known because of their unique patterns that they have on their ventral side of the flukes, which are individual specific. And then we have more species because the list goes on and on. We have common dolphins. Uh, they're way more slender than their bottlenose, and they have this kind of hourglass pattern on the side, this ochre of uh, patch behind the eye and it's very long beak or definitely more slender and longer beak than the bottlenose let's put it this way um, the rhesus dolphin are also sighted they are very unique because of all the scars that they acquire um, over time the older they get the more scars and the lighter they become as well then we have the, nor the northern bottlenose whale um, and um, that is also sighted in the in the area. Uh, it's um, very particular because there is a beak to be visible there, but the head is very kind of rounded. Um, so the silhouette of the head is very unusual for dolphins. Um, and and they have, well, the, the fin is literally like two thirds along the back, like on a tri triangular shape. And then the, their coloration also can, can be on the orange yellow side because of diatom layers that could show. Um, going towards the last sighted species, then we have the sower bee, sower bees, big whale, and we have a record uh, that comes from this year in Northeast England. It was sighted off Whitworth, and um, very unique sighting. It was um, the long beak was captured uh, very well by people on site that reported it. The tusks are generally also something very distinct. Uh, both tasks visible from the lower jaw. Last but not least, say whales. Uh, we have uh, records of them in our database dating back to 2009. They're very similar to minke, but way bigger. Minke whales are no more than 10 meters. Say whales are way bigger than that, but still are smaller than fin whales, just to give you an idea. The fin is taller and is maybe not as falcate as the one of minkies. So these are all species that you can cite in Northeast England. Think about the incredible variety of diversity. So uh, heading towards the end of the presentation, I really would like to thank all our collaborators and supporters. I don't even know where to begin here. Um, thank you so much, everyone. I uh, put as many logos of as many collaborators that join our National Rainbow from Watch here as I could. Thank you all so very much for Keep on supporting us for joining this year events one event once more thank you so much for for sharing for your passion for um for everything um i mean we would have not had such a successful event without your support without your help and um science is all about collaborating and connecting and, and that's what this slide really represents I also would like to give a special thank to our sponsors. This year we had three sponsors, Rip Curl Made of Sunday and Danny Williams Illustration. They've they've gone uh, they've done so much to support our event that I 
uh, I don't know even where to begin. Uh, Rip Curl. Uh, Rip Curl has been supporting our event and provided prices uh, for our raffle since last year. When this year they sent us uh, a box of goodies, let's call them this way, I was speechless. It was like Christmas time. There was so much in there that um, it was incredible. We had wristwatches, we had wetsuits, we had shirts, we have we had so much. Thank you so much, Rip Curl. It has been incredible to have your support and um, you've made with your gifts so many people happy this year. Thank you so much. Made of Sundays, it's a family run business that's in Helsinki. Uh, we got in touch with them for the first time this year. They provided a voucher discount. They sell um, stickers and wall art, which is made of high quality plastic free materials. And uh, it's an incredible, incredibly new partner to have this year. So thank you so much to them as well. And last but not least, Danny Williams. She uh, crafted an A4 Baham back and, and citation stickers that were given away as well. And they were incredibly nicely made. And it's great to have um, gifts from, from Danny as well. Last year, she, um, she supported us as well. So second year in a row. Thank you so much. Uh, last but not least, 2021. Um, well, it's it's really quite far away from now, but if um, if nothing happens, if COVID allows, et cetera, et cetera, um, the 2021 dates are summarized on the slides. Our National Land Dolphin Watch should run on July 24th until August 1st, COVID permitting. Um, if you want to know more about the event, please email us. You can find us at nww.cwatchfoundation.org.uk. We are going to check the email on and off uh, from now until next year, but generally we restart checking the account more rigorously from May when the event uh, restarts again, or we at least start organizing it. Um, please follow us on social media. Check our website um, for daily blogs or weekly blogs, actually, for now. Um, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and on YouTube. We'll advertise our results even more after this presentation. And um, please um, just follow us there. And if you want to know more about what we do, if you want to join us, um, um, you know, we also have launched a new membership scheme. Um, so take a look at the link here below just to know um, how to um, join our family and our community. So last but not least, um, I'm going to turn on my video if I can. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, long presentation, I hope you're still there uh, following it. Uh, yes, it's um, very exciting to talk um, National and Dolphin Watch to uh, remember everything that has happened. So exciting to have the chance to analyze all the data and see all the incredible results and all that we have achieved. Thank you so much again. And um, if there are any questions, I'll be happy to um, answer them. So thanks again and goodbye.